Um, thank you for, for having me today. And uh, the talk today that I'd like to um, introduce the concept of um, connected traffic signals. Um, I'd like to really focus this talk on being um, informative for those who may be very unfamiliar with the transportation side of this uh, question, as, as well as giving some good um, ideas for those who may be interested in researching this topic further. So uh, real quickly, uh, when we talk about uh, CAV in general, connected autonomous vehicles, specifically connected vehicles can be thought of as its own isolated topic. And so when we think about connected vehicles, the concept here really revolves around specifically the vehicles being connected through wireless communication uh, to other vehicles. That's typically uh, denoted as V to V communication. They may be also be connected to infrastructure. That would be V to I. And then V to X is a generic term for any kind of communication that can include pedestrians, bicyclists, and others. And really this whole concept here uh, really revolves around specifically the connectivity and not necessarily um, thinking solely about autonomy. So in this case, the connected messages may be sent um, and read by a human, or they may be utilized by a autonomous vehicle system itself. And so in this way, um, a lot of the talk that we talk about today is going to focus on what is contained in those messages, what kind of information is there, and less about how an autonomous vehicle, for instance, may specifically use that information. Um, I do want to have this be um, informative for those who may be very unfamiliar with uh, traffic signals in general. So I'm going to start with a few slides going over some of the basics of traffic signal control. Um, there's three major components for uh, most traffic signals that operate around in the United States. Um, at the core, the brains behind the traffic signal is the traffic signal controller. Um, this is usually contained within a cabinet that's nearby the intersection. And it's connected to both uh, detectors and uh, traffic signal heads that show the actual um, red, yellow, green uh, information to the drivers. And so um, detectors uh, can be uh, any number of specific uh, equipment systems, but the key there is that for almost all traffic signals that are uh, constructed today, we, we do want to operate those traffic signals based on actual traffic. And so to do that, we do need some form of detection to know when vehicles are present. Um, otherwise, we cannot operate the vehicle, the uh, traffic signal um, in relation to the vehicles that we see. So when we think about how traffic control works um, at the traffic signal, there's a few different uh, high level schemes which are utilized. Um, many of these schemes are fallback schemes. So the first one that we list here, the flash, um, is something that is uh, you may be very familiar with if you've ever seen um, a very, very rural location that may have uh, emergency flashers. So some uh, traffic signals are set up solely to be um, that kind of an emergency um, operation, or they may indicate a, a always stop that would be flashing red, um, or a two-way stop where one direction is flashing red for uh, the stop approach, and then the free-flowing approach may be flashing yellow to indicate caution. Um, however, flash control is also uh, a hardwired fallback scheme, which is used for traffic signals, which may fall out of any, any of the other schemes. So for some reason, uh, time of day issue, some, something goes wrong in the programming, there is a hardware uh, component in the traffic controller um, that will flash the signals no matter what in order to maintain safety operations uh, from the traffic signal. If we go up to the next level, uh, fixed time traffic control uh, is a much older system. Uh, these are still used in some cases where you don't want to put detection in the roadway. Um, the fixed time control is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you time out exactly how long you want each phase, each direction to have green. Um, you time out the yellows and the red periods, and then the, uh, the truck signal is operating solely on that um, information. In the old days, they actually would have a mechanical controller, and so there would be a dial that's spinning inside of the controller uh, with a uh, wire connection, and every time that the wire touched um, a certain time in the dial, uh, it would actually change phases. And so that uh, old-style control is still used in some cases, uh, again, usually at very low volume um, at uh, locations where there's no detection uh, present. Fully actuated control is going the opposite way. And so in fully actuated control, you set up uh, detection to run the traffic signal. You may give some boundaries, a minimum to maximum uh, for the green times, but uh, overall that system will run solely based on how much vehicles are approaching for each direction. The most common um, in an open setting is semi-actuated or coordinated control. 
And in these cases, when you have closely spaced traffic signals where you're trying to progress traffic uh, through many signals at once, you have these coordinated systems where there is some limitations that allow um, progression to occur and allow um, traffic uh, platoons um, to progress through the system. Um, but all the other movements outside of that progress movement are run on an actuated basis. And then finally, uh, a more novel system uh, control that's been utilized recently is an adaptive um, or uh, traffic responsive type of system. And these systems, uh, they rely on uh, advanced uh, types of detection that can get some more information uh, in addition to the presence of the vehicle themselves to get information about uh, the waiting time of the vehicle, the length of the queue, and they can use that to do some optimization of the traffic signal controller in real time. Uh, I mentioned the detectors. Uh, there are many different types of detection that are um, available for uh, traffic signals. Um, the type of detection can change the type of data you may get out of the traffic signal controller. So if you're looking to utilize the uh, detection data, um, that's one key thing to think about is what type of detection is present. The most common uh, type is the inductive loop. And so this is a small loop of wire that's uh, inlaid into the pavement that uh, picks up the um, electromagnetic force of the vehicle that's passing over the detector. Uh, that sends a pulse to the uh, traffic signal controller that indicates uh, there's an arrival for the vehicles there. There's also piezoelectric, microwave radar, video, uh, pedestrian push button is, is a type of detection that's for pedestrians, uh, as well as thermal uh, imaging that's used as well. So these different detector types, the main uh, purpose of them is to provide information to the traffic controller about the demand uh, of vehicles that are approaching at each of the um, approaches. And for most of the control types, uh, some type of detection is needed to operate efficiently. So when we think about the traditional traffic signals and moving into connected traffic signals, um, we have here a diagram of the kind of architecture for uh, connected, tra connected traffic signal systems. On the left side, there is the traffic management aspect, and this is usually um, performed at a uh, system level. So that may be a full municipality that's operating all their traffic signals together. It may be a state system where the state is operating um, some of the rural systems together. Um, in the center, we have the equipment that's on the roadside. And so some of this may be um, ITS equipment, intelligent transportation systems equipment. Um, as well as the actual connected vehicle system equipment that's on the roadside as well. So the top portion there of the center, um, that kind of equipment may be present even in a non-connected um, environment, but the bottom portion is specifically added to enable the connectivity. And finally, on the right side, we have the end users of the system. So they may be pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, drivers, and they're connected to the system in the case of the driver through an onboard uh, device. And that uh, device uh, communicates with the truck civil controller, um, as well as with the driver, um, if there's a human-driven vehicle that's using the connected vehicle data. So we'll go over some of these components from the infrastructure side in a little bit more detail. The traffic signal cabinet um, that I mentioned is usually on one of the corners of the intersections. The components that are listed here um, are, are numbered, and the, the key component, obviously, of the traffic signal uh, cabinet is the controller itself. Uh, that's the brains behind the operation. That's where all of the timings are programmed. It's where all the logic is housed within there. Um, there is a uh, conflict monitor, and this is a critical uh, piece of equipment that's in every single traffic signal cabinet. The conflict monitor ensures that uh, conflicting movements that would be unsafe to operate together are physically not allowed to operate at the same time. And so there's actual physical, physical wire connections for all of these combinations of movements, and they physically cut the wires for uh, movement combinations, which would be unsafe. And so in this way, if you think about like a movie like The Italian Job or any of these movies where somebody has hacked into the traffic signal controller and they're giving green to the direction that they want to go, um, in the case of uh, real uh, real life that we have on the roadside, um, even if someone was able to hack into this, they could maybe give one of the two directions green, but they could not give both directions green and they could not cause unsafe movements to show. Um, there's some additional equipment that's on the controller itself. I mentioned the physical flasher that's there um, as a backup. Obviously, if power is completely lost, the, the signals will go blank, but um, in any other error state of the, of the controller, um, the flasher will always uh, default to operate. Um, in addition, 
Um, the detectors uh, come in uh, to the back panel, and then from there, uh, the output from the controller is sent through um, the different uh, load switches, which usually there's one load switch for each signal head, and that will give you uh, red, yellow, and green on the same channel. So from the cabinet, um, there are some uh, additional components that may be added for connected systems. And so the first one is the uh, roadside unit. The roadside unit is actually the component that's actually sending the information back and forth um, from the sitting controller. And often there will be a uh, processor that goes between the traditional traffic signal controller and the roadside unit so that some additional processes may be um, added in to give some more information to the messages that are promoted to the public. The uh, roadside unit is sending uh, four typical types of messages when it's on a, at a traffic signal. Um, the first is a travel information message, and this is a kind of a generic message. It may be targeted um, or it may be an area wide uh, notification. It gives information at a high level um, and may give a warning uh, if there's uh, some kind of severe weather or other um, severe event that the public should know about. The next is the signal phase and timing message. This uh, SPAT message is one that uh, communicates to the vehicles the current status of all of the individual signal phases, um, as well as some of the uh, some of the systems also give you um, how long that current status is planned to proceed. So these messages are constantly being broadcast, but by providing some additional information about how long the current status may last, that gives the vehicle um, or driver some time um, to do some planning about that. Um, in order for the vehicle or the driver to know exactly what part of that message they should be looking at, there's a map message which correlates each individual lane position and location to the corresponding uh, signal phase that's uh, that's relevant. And in this way, either a human driven vehicle or an automated vehicle can correctly um, uh, utilize this fat message uh, to understand what's going on. There's also a signal status message, and this one gives you some high level information about the signal's operation um, and any errors that may be occurring that can go back to the traffic management center. Uh, on the receiving side, the uh, signals uh, the connected traffic signal may be receiving uh, basic safety messages. And so these are messages that are broadcast on a regular frequency from the uh, vehicles that are passing by. There's a standard layout for that basic safety message that has two components, and we'll talk about that in more detail later on in the presentation. Um, but both components may be used in the case of the traffic signal. Um, and then it also can be receiving a signal request message, and this is basically uh, a dedicated message that uh, emulates uh, some of what you might get from a, um, a detection system. And so in this way, uh, the signal system does not have to completely process a basic safety message in order to use the uh, connected vehicle data to operate the traffic signal. I mentioned the traffic management center. Um, the uh, traffic management was done, again, uh, typically, uh, together within either a local municipality, it may be done regionally or maybe done statewide. These centers uh, typically, as you can see on the picture here, this is the statewide center um, in Raleigh, and uh, they have usually a video wall. They have um, uh, software to manage their system. They also um, have uh, live feeds of data from other sources as well. So in this case, they may have uh, probe data, which is data that's uh, gives you the uh, speed um, and operations around the uh, traffic network, as well as some information um, that they be getting from the safety side. So they may have crash information um, or uh, works on information that's uh, available to the traffic management center. Um, the actual connection to the traffic signal systems is through an advanced traffic management software. So these softwares are commercially available softwares that uh, enable the operators at the TMC to directly uh, monitor and modify any of the signals. Um, these systems are pretty high tech nowadays, and so they integrate mapping, they integrate all of the data that's coming in and out of the traffic signals, um, as well as they often can uh, show the live video for specific locations as well. And a lot of times they're also used for management um, and maintenance as well. So if you're looking at uh, an issue that comes up for a detector that has broken down, uh, you can quickly create a uh, maintenance request to, to fix those. From the vehicle side, uh, the uh, onboard unit is the main communication aspect um, that is, is utilizing the traffic signal. 
Um, in addition to what it receives from the connected traffic signal, the data that it gets from the vehicle itself can come either from the CAN bus itself, which uh, contains all of the data that's coming uh, through all the electronic systems on the vehicle, uh, or it can be the more formatted OBD2 data, um, which is a specific data format um, that's available for all um, vehicles uh, since the year 2000. Um, in addition, um, the onboard unit would probably have a GPS unit attached to it um, to allow itself to position, uh, as well as some form of communication to communicate with the next uh, infrastructure. And so that may be DSRC, dynamic uh, short range communications, maybe cellular or Wi Fi. Um, but in the end, if there is a human um, that's uh, operating the vehicle, there does need to be some uh, HMI that's broadcasting the information. Um, to the human. And in this case, the HMI may have a lot of processes that occur before the actual information is broadcast, but in the end, those core messages are what's feeding um, that HMI to give information to the driver. So outside of these components, um, I wanna go through uh, some uh, sample deployments and kind of talk about how these deployments relate to um, the current uh, state of the practice uh, for connected traffic signals. The first deployment I'm going to talk about is the SPAT challenge. And so um, in uh, ASHTO is the uh, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, um, and they issued what's called the SPAT challenge. Um, and that challenge was basically to try to get at least one deployment of uh, SPAT messaging to occur for each state uh, by uh, the year 2020. And that challenge was issued um, by ASHTO along with uh, support from USDOT. In the case of North Carolina, we have currently one operational deployment and one planned deployment. The operational deployment that we have in North Carolina is in Cary on NC55. Um, these traffic signals are connected um, through DSRC communications. They're constantly broadcasting the SPAT message. Um, those are still active today, as far as I know. Um, However, the critical aspect of the SPAT challenge is that it really related to the uh, technical aspects behind getting uh, multi uh, traffic signals deployed. And so a lot of that came down to um, FCC regulations. It came down to acquisition of hardware installation and really kind of building in that knowledge that's required at the agency level. So because of that, there wasn't a big drive to do a lot of uh, data analysis behind the, the program. And so in the end, most of the deployments that we have that are available through the SPAT challenge are only broadcasting live data on site. They're not usually going and sending any data back to um, be recorded. Um, and there's no typically no API ac access or other way to actually get access to that live data other than actually being present near the signal itself. So if you had an onboard device on your vehicle, um, you could uh, get the messages and carry, but otherwise, there's no current way to access the data that comes out of the system. In addition to the SPAT challenge, um, USDOT developed a connected vehicle pilot program. Um, they ended up selecting three uh, pilot deployments. Um, these pilot deployments really focused on a large variety of connected vehicle applications. And so um, not all of these are related specifically to connected traffic signals. Um, However, uh, they have a great uh, resource in that they are um, all open data sets. And so there's access to um, current data as well as historic data for these deployments. So I'll talk briefly about each of the deployments um, that we have operating today. The first one, the Tampa um, CV pilot is led by the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority. They had a number of uh, different applications that they looked at, some related to um, vehicle to infrastructure communications, some were vehicle to vehicle, and then some were general mobility improvements. And so the graphic on the left kind of shows where they planned out these different activities, but really what they're looking at are combinations of messages and data that's collected at both the individual vehicle level as well as at the network level. The way that this is communicated to um, different use cases. Uh, in case of the bus drivers, they have um, some detection systems that provide them information about um, either pedestrians or vehicles that may be in the way of, in the travel path of the vehicle when it's looking to make a turn. And so they have a heads up display that provides uh, a quick uh, indication of if there's anything blocking their turning movement. Uh, for passenger cars, they have a 
um, little visualization in the review um, mirror that's available that gives different types of messages. Uh, the messages they uh, ended up selecting were ones that were fairly simple to um, indicate and to provide some information about uh, wrong wing movements, about vehicles that were stopped ahead, um, as well about the, as well as uh, about the traffic signal. Um, and they were able to, they were able to install these um, for most of the vehicles. Um, in this case, they're looking to put these in uh, the public's vehicles, and so they were able to put a little um, device that you can see in the bottom right, small and obtrusive device that's connected to the OBD2 port as well as uh, to um, the heads-up display to give them the information um, in real time. And they also connected a transmitting uh, receiver at the top of the vehicle uh, to collect the data. In Wyoming, uh, the application that they're looking at was primarily around freeways, and so it's not extremely relevant to specifically connected uh, traffic signals. Um, however, uh, the applications they're looking at included forward collision, um, work zones, uh, as well as weather. And so some of these aspects were kind of unique compared to some of the other deployments, especially the work zone application is one um, that's very um, interesting application, especially when you're thinking about uh, the types of uh, mapping and uh, performance for the automated side, um, autonomous vehicles typically are going to operate in an area where they've already done some pre-mapping of the facility. And so if they go and map the facility um, with LIDAR, with their um, high-resolution data, they may uh, assume that that uh, geometry, the facility itself, is kind of a fixed condition. However, during uh, temporary work zones, obviously, uh, tones go in place. Mm -hmm. And now that uh, geometry has actually changed. And so uh, enabling connected vehicle messaging around work zones uh, gives better information to uh, the autonomous side as well. And some of these applications uh, fell along uh, the corridor on I-80 in Wyoming. And you kind of see here uh, the different areas where they're looking for uh, weather warnings, areas where they're looking for snowplow data, and also where they're looking to see how their coverage works. And um, Connected vehicle data is something that has been pushed heavily in urban areas. So this Wyoming deployment was another interesting uh, deployment to look at how uh, the restrictions of a more rural uh, impact connected vehicle messaging, where you saw um, second way that may not be fully covered by all the um, connected vehicle systems. Moving over to New York City, we have um, a number of applications that New York City was looking at. Um, their environment was the most urban. It's also one that's looking to be very multimodal. And so in this case, um, in addition to some of the other um, applications we have, we have um, pedestrian and crosswalk um, and accessible pedestrian signals, as well as we had some information that was provided to the bus systems um, for this pilot. And we have some uh, graphics showing um, some testing that happened first in almost all of these systems require a lot of uh, close course testing prior to deployment in the field. And so um, in the end, the uh, types of applications that New York City was looking at involved either using an existing um, uh, screen that was already in the vehicle, like the one in the top right, or on the bottom left, if the vehicles did not have an existing screen available, um, they could put their own um, tablet to provide with the information that they're looking to uh, provide. And again, uh, on the bottom right is an um, image of the onboard device that's connected to uh, the vehicle to provide all the messages and uh, connect back to the display as well. So um, de deployments are especially interesting because we start to get some real world data around connected messaging and understand uh, really how these messages are generated, how they're utilized, um, what kind of trends we would be able to pull out of this. Um, in addition, if you're interested in examining a certain specific application type, um, you can look and see the performance of those systems and compare, to, uh, compare that to the real world data. So looking at the device deployment status for the USDOT program, they have a number of devices deployed um, for each of the uh, locations. Right now, what they're looking at um, with Wyoming is that they have um, around uh, 51 uh, vehicles and 75 uh, devices on the roadside. In uh, Tampa, that's 716 uh, vehicles and 47 devices on the roadside. And then finally, New York City has a much larger sample. They're looking at over 1,600 vehicles at this point that have been equipped and 400 uh, roadside units that are uh, enabled at this time. And so uh, these deployments are, are fairly sizable and uh, 
the the data access is the real reason why I wanted to highlight these programs because um, most uh, of the um, the uh, development that we've had from uh, practice uh, in connected vehicle uh, systems and especially connected traffic signals have been on the actual vendor side. So the ones that are uh, working on the actual equipment that are going to be um, creating this are often the ones that are uh, tweaking or modifying the individual application types. And so uh, from that sense, if the vendor themselves was making modifications and selling that back to um, agencies, that may not be a very transparent process if that was not done um, through one of these uh, pilot programs. But by doing it through the USDOT pilot, um, all of that data is transparent and is available to researchers. Finally, the uh, latest um, uh, change that's happened around connected traffic signal systems is the um, onset of uh, cellular uh, V2X communications. And so um, it's being tested around the world, but right now we do have a test uh, deployment in Ferry, North Carolina of this type of a system. Um, specifically cellular versus uh, DSRC is an interesting decision because uh, cellular can certainly handle higher bandwidth. Um, it also has existing communications infrastructure that's already available. DSRC is a short range radio that needs to be installed on the roadside and on the vehicles um, in order to uh, facilitate that communication. However, DSRC is a very low latency um, communication platform. And so um, because of that, uh, the higher latency of cellular communications uh, may be detrimental if you're trying to do a really time sensitive safety application. Um, right now, the way that it exists right now, the FCC has uh, the 5.9 gigahertz uh, spectrum of the band. Uh, reserved for DSRC communications for um, connected vehicles. And that uh, reservation, though, is uh, is uh, uh, due to be changed. Um, right now, in the November FCC um, quarterly meeting, they are planning to discuss uh, proposed rulemaking. Um, they already had the comment period for this proposed rulemaking. This rulemaking would change uh, 45 of the megahertz uh, to be allowed for unlicensed devices, which is basically Wi-Fi, it could be cellular as well. Um, and then just the upper 30 megahertz would be reserved. But they, in the FCC communication, they're already um, saying that they want to exclude DSRC from the 5.9 gigahertz, and they want to only enable uh, cellular V2X communication within the 5.9, uh, the upper 30 megahertz that's reserved for um, connected vehicle messaging. And so this would be a really big change. Right now, there are no um, uh, large scale deployments that use cellular Vita X at the level that uh, DSRC has been tested. DSRC has been tested since uh, the mid 1990s and has uh, a large set of um, standards that have been developed around that. So this would be a really big shakeup to uh, connected systems. Um, when we think about data, uh, this is the last kind of section I want to kind of touch on, because I think as researchers, we may be very interested in how we actually use this information. So um, from the traffic signal side, there are some traditional and more advanced systems that are really transportation related. And then there's the data that really comes in at the communication for connected systems. So the first set of uh, kind of traditional traffic signal controllers, um, these type of uh, outputs would be available from any controllers um, that have uh, modern uh, traffic signal control. So maybe some of the fixed home control may not have uh, this data present, but for most of the systems around the country, we have this available. Uh, split monitor, detector log, timing plan. I'll, I'll mention briefly what each of those contains. When you think about the more advanced applications, um, really uh, ATSPM automated traffic signal performance measures is a evolution of looking at uh, traffic signal performance. And in this case, what they're looking at is instead of aggregating a lot of data, they're looking at the individual uh, signal states. And so here they're looking at when does, when does each of the uh, signal phases change? Um, when when do calls get made to the uh, from the detector to the traffic signal controller, and all of these microscopic data is then aggregated into higher level performance measures. Uh, the connected messages that uh, we receive, um, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail, include uh, the stat message, the map message, uh, the TIM message, and the basic safety message. And uh, these protocols uh, or these messages are. are um, Defined uh, again under SAE uh, J2735. Um, that's a DSRC message set dictionary. It provides all the um, background information about each of those messages the um, SPAT, MAP, uh, TIM, and, and BSM message. 
Um, and the actual communication level uh, protocol for DSRC uh, on the lower layers is IEEE P802.11 um, P, and the upper layers is the um, IEEE uh, P1609 series uh, protocols. And so um, that's, again, the only protocols that we really have established. There's not an established protocol for connected, or for, sorry, for cellular um, V2X communications at this stage. So what kind of information would you get out of some of the traditional uh, traffic signal controller outputs? The split monitor is typically delivered either like a CSV file um, or a PDF file. It's going to give you information at a high level about the traffic uh, signal operations for things like cycle length, uh, the green times for the individual movements, and the splits. Uh, the detector log is uh, typically a CSV file that will be output by the controller. Um, that log can be uh, indicating the detector events by the individual detector number. So you need to have some kind of a, a plan that shows which detector number relates back to each of the phases, because you can have multiple detectors for each phase. Um, and that log is often either time stamped with individual events, if it's high resolution data, or it can be aggregate, so you can get the total count for that detector number um, over a one minute, five minute, or 10 minute uh, time horizon. And then finally, the timing plan is typically a PDF uh, document that's provided. And this is the plan that the uh, traffic engineer has to confirm before um, that's put into the traffic signal controller. Uh, that will include the uh, type of control by time of day, including if there are multiple different timings by time of day. Uh, that will show the planned uh, cycle length and phase settings. Um, those, there's a lot of phase settings. You know, there's dozens and dozens, but some of the key ones to think about are the minimum, maximum green. So any of the actuated systems where uh, the detectors can allow that to be shorter or longer, there may be a boundary condition for the minimum and maximum greens. There's settings called recall. And so recall is really useful when you have uh, the potential for a detector to fail. You may want to always give a call to that uh, phase no matter what. Also, if you're coordinating uh, traffic, you always want to have that uh, coordinated movement on recall so that that coordinated movement is coming up every single cycle, even if there's not a vehicle present at the time when it comes up. And then finally, gap extension. Um, this is one that's uh, used a lot when you have a upstream detector. And so this may be three to 400 feet upstream um, of the stop bar. And this detector will send a call to the controller, which will extend the green for long enough for the vehicle to pass through the uh, intersection without having to stop. And so this is really important to increase uh, driver satisfaction. If, you, if you're coming up to the signal, you see it's green, and then you just miss, uh, and it changes to yellow and red, uh, it's a really unsatisfying uh, condition. And so this gap extension um, is how we're able to uh, keep that green going for the vehicle that we know is approaching. I mentioned the high resolution data that goes into um, ATSPM, and we have some sample deployments that you could look at if you're interested in diving into the traffic signal data that comes out of it. Um, at a high level, uh, the uh, microscopic data, the individual activations of the detectors, the individual changes of the phase states um, are all recorded into a database. And then from that database, a set of uh, performance measures are extracted. Uh, the top left graph shows uh, the summary for an approach's um, volume across a day. The bottom left shows uh, conditions where you may have failure. And so in this case, the yellow bands show uh, cycle failure, where we think that a um, movement of more demand, more traffic that wanted to get through and was not able to get all the way through during green. And then finally, on the far right, we have a, a really advanced uh, graphic. Um, this is really useful for traffic engineers to see um, how well traffic is going through a uh, progressed or coordinated um, uh, system. And so in this case, the bands show um, below the green uh, is uh, your red time, above the green is your green time. And if uh, the small black dots are individual vehicles that are arriving, and so if the black dots are arriving below the green band, that's indicating that they're arriving during red. And if it's above the green band, they're arriving during green. And so for a good progression, you'd want to see a cluster of more dots above the green. And so this kind of a graphic is really useful in diagnosing how well your system is progressing. When we think about the connected messages, um, the first message, the SPAT message, is one of the most critical ones if you're thinking about the infrastructure level data itself. Um, this message, yes. 
Hi, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I have a really quick question. Can you go to the previous slide, please? Yes. Uh, what is the in the upper left image? What is the blue line, the through right? What do you mean by that? Yes. So in this case, the um, movement that they're showing in the report is the eastbound through movement. And so the um, ATSPM system is, 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 is a software system. And so if you select eastbound through, it wants to show you the volume for those movements. And um, in the um, legend, we can see lane one and lane two listed. Um, however, there is a third lane that is shared. And so in this case, they list it separately through right to indicate that if you're looking for through count, it may not be uh, completely, uh, that, that blue line may not be all through movement vehicles. And so some of the right turn vehicles would be included in that as well. Okay, so you mean that this is the lane that they can make a right turn, right? Yeah, so so in this case, the through right means it's a combined through and right together in uh -huh. one. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. I'm sorry for the, you know. Mm -hmm. No problem. So the spec message, um, again, this communicates to the vehicles what the current state is for all the different phases. Um, on the right, I have kind of a sample of some of the data that comes out of this. Um, so you're looking for a signal group. Um, again, the signal group is, uh, is the phase or, or the, um, well, you can think of it as the traffic signal uh, head that the current state for that. Um, there's different uh, event states, the um, stop date, the protected state, um, the permitted state, a protected versus permitted for traffic signals relates to how turning movements are handled. So for a protected turning movement, the turning movement is uh, allowed to proceed um, without having to worry about oncoming vehicles to get again. So that protected movement would be like a green arrow. A permitted movement would be a turning movement that has, for instance, a green ball. And so in that case, for those movements, you do have to wait for oncoming vehicles to see a gap, and then you can go through and proceed. Um, and so for turning movements, it can be protected or permitted. Um, each of these states also in this uh, sample here show a timing and end time. And so again, if you're looking for trajectory planning or to account for how much longer uh, the green, uh, yellow, or red may be uh, available, uh, that gives you some uh, idea of when that phase is to end. However, when we think about the actuated or semi-actuated systems, it's important to keep in mind that that end time may be variable. So if more vehicles arrive, that end time may get extended. And so uh, typically what they uh, report is what they know as the minimum end time um, for vehicles to plan. However, there are some more advanced systems that are being tested. There's a system in Florida that's being tested um, that actually does prediction based on vehicle arrivals and tries to estimate the actual um, end time during an actuated signal. Uh, the vehicles uh, receive this message. And again, uh, if a, uh, autonomous vehicle system is using the message, they may use that system directly in their algorithms, the SPAT message. Um, if a human is using it, um, the HMI must interpret the SPAT message and provide specifically the information that the driver needs to see. So this message in includes all of the phases. The driver does not need to see every phase at once. And so the HMI would need to make sure that it uh, cuts down to just the data that's uh, important for that specific vehicle. Uh, the way to do that, again, is the map. Um, the map file uh, is a spatial reference um, for each of the lanes. Uh, it indicates which turning movements can occur out of each lane, and it also indicates which uh, phase group um, or signal group is related to that lane. And so in this way, if you know uh, your GPS location very well, um, you may be able to then say, okay, well, I know that I'm in lane number seven, and then this map message would say, okay, well, lane number seven needs to look at signal group number two, and then now you know what to filter down in your uh, SPAT message. There are some limitations with the map. Um, there may be a local map definition, so uh, it may not always be reported in exactly in um, uh, GPS terms. It may be uh, a, a foot measurement system if there's a statewide coordinate system um, that it may be using as well. It may be a local system entirely where there's some other um, uh, global reference that needs to be pulled on. Um, it also does not reflect dynamic conditions typically. Um, so all of the applications so far are typically looking at conditions where um, the length themselves are fixed. There's not work zones going on. But as I mentioned, there is some testing around how to send um, work zone messages uh, that's going on in the Wyoming uh, connected vehicle pilot. Um, finally, if you're looking at um, even a uh, human using the message uh, itself, 
there is some potential off planning that's needed um, or some forecasting that's needed. So if a driver, for instance, has their left turn um, indicator on, but they haven't yet got to the point where the left turn bay opens, they may be expecting to make a left turn there. They may be looking for what is the signal phase for the left turn signal, but they're currently in a through lane um, upstream. And so because of that, if you look at solely your current position, you might show the wrong signal indication. And so if you're wanting to handle uh, that kind of um, longer term um, trajectory behavior, you may need to be able to do some planning or some estimation of that future uh, path in order to correctly send the right information to the driver. The travel information message, um, again, is an advisory type of message. It can be information about incidents, uh, general traffic information. If there's a major event nearby, a special event like a uh, football game or something like that, that may be majorly impacting traffic, um, as well as emergency evacuations. All of these um, can go through this tra uh, travel information message. Um, typically, there's a hierarchy for um, what would need to be sent over the system, and the messages are often generated at the TMC level by the management uh, uh, center rather than by one individual traffic signal. So the message may be broadcast to a region. That broadcast is done uh, through maybe the fiber backbone that goes to the traffic signal controller, and then that message is broadcast through um, the uh, the DSRC communications to the vehicle, um, but that message may not be unique to just that one intersection. It may be common across a lot of intersections in the area. Um, the uh, messages, again, they could be targeted to that specific location. They may be for a local area or maybe a broad regional area as well. The key uh, data that's coming out of vehicles themselves is the basic safety message. And so this has a um, uh, well-built standard, again, um, the, uh, data dictionary through the SAE standard um, has been used for uh, many years. And um, the um, data that comes out of that is uh, two individual um, types of data. So one is a consistent message um, called the part one message uh, that gives you information about uh, kind of the vehicle trajectory information. And then there's a secondary set of information in part two that's an optional message. And so if there's no event state change in those data points, they may skip that message for that frequency for reporting. Um, but the basic safety message part one, uh, the trajectory information is sent at every every interval um, at 10 hertz. And uh, the uh, data that is included um, is anonymized. And so the basic safety message has an anonymous ID um, system where uh, the ID of the vehicle itself that's sent is, um, is scrambled and is, is uh, randomized uh, at regular intervals to prevent someone from being tracked in the network. Um, the type of data that's included um, in red here is your part one data. Um, again, uh, time, position, um, heading, acceleration, braking, uh, vehicle size. Then um, not always used for all safety applications would be something like the steering wheel angle. So you can actually see um, how far the steering wheel is turned. Um, as well as positional accuracy, which gives you some uh, concept of how um, much you can trust the location data that's coming out of the vehicle. Um, the part two data in blue, um, again, this is more event state data. And so, um, for instance, uh, the uh, braking condition, if there's some path prediction going on, uh, throttle position, the mass of the vehicle, uh, vehicle type description, um, and then in the subsystems on the vehicle, a lot of these subsystems like ABS, stability control, uh, wipers, lights, these systems have a, a bunch of binary data that can be uh, sent as well in this uh, part two package. Um, the way that the BSM standard works is that um, you can comply with the standard if you're sending the part one message only as well. Um, so some older vehicles may not be able to get access to um, the ABS status, stability control status, directly out of the CAN bus, like you may be able to do in newer vehicles. And so it's possible for an older vehicle um, to still be compliant, um, but there's a lot of more information that you can extract um, out of the part two message that gives you more contextual information, as well as things like uh, weather condition um, and, uh, and other um, environmental uh, conditions as well. Um, some important things that are often used in uh, traffic analysis that would not be available in the BSM are the type of fuel that the vehicle uses, uh, fuel consumption rates, uh, emissions, uh, the current fuel level of the gas tank, 
um, the grade of the uh, roadway, the drive cycle operating mode, and engine temperature. A lot of those are used to understand um, performance data and emissions data, and they're not typically available through the basic safety message. So how would you guys get access to some of this data if you're interested in looking for more? I mentioned the connected vehicle pilot that USDOT is running. That has a, a website. Um, the link is provided here um, that's available online. Currently, Tampa and Wyoming have live feeds, and I think there's a uh, data extract for New York City as well. Um, the archive data is available for Tampa and Wyoming as well. So if you want to get a longer longitudinal data set, that is available. Um, in addition to the raw data themselves, there are some visualizations that are on the website that can help you um, get a feel for if that type of data is something that you'd be interested in uh, researching further. And uh, the data is available uh, both in uh, table downloads as well as live API feeds if you're interested in getting some kind of live processing going. In addition, there's other uh, connected vehicle data sets that are available that I'm listing here. Um, the uh, some ones that are uh, larger that I'll uh, mention that I've uh, worked with myself. The safety pilot model deployment in Michigan is a great data set that includes um, a lot of information uh, for a limited number of vehicles, I think around 100 vehicles, uh, but it's a lot of high resolution data. In addition to the basic safety message, they even record some additional uh, information about the vehicle's uh, status as well as the infrastructure. Um, the uh, multimodal intelligent traffic signal systems, we're talking about connected traffic signal systems, and uh, this is an example of using uh, connected vehicles um, for getting uh, improvement in operations for the traffic signal systems themselves. So in this case, they're not just uh, reading in data and not using it. In this case, the traffic signal system itself is trying to optimize based on the connected um, and intelligent messages that are being sent back and forth um, between the vehicle and infrastructure. So that's the introduction that I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or, or give any, uh, any tips um, if anyone's interested.